All right, so uh, here it is, plain and simple. Uh, this is this is the route. Uh, okay. Six 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 six. Over business one. Squad, I'm taking report of an altercation. Sick Temple, seventy five twelve South Howell. There's a lot of noise. I'm unable to get much info, but there's a fight, and now it's. Six five copies from three oh one. Eight four. Are you from America? Ten four. Six six from Ryan Rope Pickens. How there may be reports of gunshots. A bald male with glasses may have shot someone. I'm going to dispatch fire department for state. Fire is responding also. Two to those. Give me the location again, please. Sick Temple, 7512 South Hall. 6 8 code 3 from the station. David Wells from 301. 85 You can give me the info on uh, who is leaving the, or if they're still on scene with the gun. Last I heard is a balding male with glasses may have gone inside with a gun and there were shots fired. Who will be going 23, I see. Stand for. One down, give me an ambulance. Message received. Hold down. I uh, need an ambulance. I do not see a shooter anywhere. And I am on the, uh, just come in behind me. Unit, we're dispatching fire. 7 8 coming up on Hollow Forest Hill, 1033. Uh, 85 1033. So, yeah, the first thing you're going to see is the guy won't get out of my way. So I got lights and sirens on. We get the call for service that it comes in as a possible fight. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm in as an active shooter, just possible fight. And then as I'm going, the guy finally gets out of my way. Then we get possible shots. Uh, and I know I'm going to be there about the same time as Sam Lender. We're both uh, coming from different areas of the city, but both equidistant to the temple itself. So as I'm going, I'm running in my head, what am I going to do? Uh, if, if it is somebody shooting it, I did go back to uh, seven months prior. There was a fight there. So when the, the two people who both attended the temple fought each other, that was another piece of the puzzle. I'm like, oh, I wonder if these guys are back at it. Now somebody brought a gun. Uh, and then once I get there, uh, I pull over to rise in a hill uh, scan, I, I see what appears to be one guy down, uh, go up on him, uh, jump out of the car, check, it looks like he's dead. Uh, what I didn't know is actually there's two of them. So that black car that originally pulled up mm -hmm. that the kids saw, uh, one brother gets it, there's two brothers in a car, one gets out of the passenger seat, starts moving towards the trunk, the brother who was driving gets out, driver's seat starts moving to the trunk, bad guys coming across and if you listen to the kids he's like he's walking then he starts speed walking but when he's walking the one brother actually raises his hand and says hey come inside have tea hmm. and that's when the gun comes out so the one brother actually tried to protect the other brother uh, and laid on top of him and he shot through both of them and killed them both but you'll hear me say I got one down uh, it's just because there's one head and they were both priests so there was uh, I only saw one set of appendages. Uh, not that it matters, but that's the way it is. So then you'll, you'll see him come out of the temple, uh, start running to running to his left, man. And uh, I, that's the part that kills me. Uh, that I'm almost 
literally, but figuratively, mm-hmm. I can. I have the hardest part with it because he comes out of the temple, he's running. Uh, I don't see the gun right away, but the minute I see the gun, I shoot. And he's running away from me, 42 yards, not looking at me, just shoots over his shoulder as I'm moving at the same time. So just put it contextually, law enforcement shooting against a moving target have a hit rate of 8%. Eight. Eight, zero eight. Uh, And he's running, not looking, shooting one-handed, over his yeah, shoulder. With a, with a shoulder. pistol. He just, with the pistol, he just yeah. throws his arm back, cracks a shot, and that hits me right in the face. So it hits the bottom of my jaw, goes down my throat. Uh, and it felt like a punch. It, it, more than anything, it just felt like a good stiff punch. Uh, I, I get behind a car, check myself quick, uh, and I'm like, okay. And first thing in my head is, oh, oh shit, you're in a gunfight. Mm-hmm. I'm like, all right, well, let's get it on. So I start looking for him. And at the funny thing about this, and, and it's another one that you don't get until you do it, you're not wearing hearing protection. Mm. Oh. So when you shoot your gun, it's like your hearing's now gone. Yeah. Done. Pretty much. It's, got, it's gone. We had uh, HK USB 45s. So my hearing's pretty, pretty well toast. And there's more shots coming, but I can't tell where they're coming from. So this loud ringing at this point. Just, yeah, it's Almost that, disoriented that, it's like ringing. Pip, pip, pip. And I'm like, all right, I know it. But I'm looking for feet. Now, when I say this, he came out and he ran to his left, my right. Mm-hmm. So where would you look for him? If you lost sight of him for a second, where would you look for him? Yeah, where he was going. Exactly. Forward. He didn't come yeah. out like, hey, where am I? No, it was like, I have a reason. So that was my first inclination is, all right, he's got to be going that way. Nothing. So I'm behind the car, uh, but, you know, the engine block and all that. And I'm like, this isn't good. So uh, there's a thing called being on the X. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to be in one spot too long. Uh, so I stand up, take one step in front of the car, uh, have my weapon up. And what had happened was he, as he's running, he takes that one shot, crack, hits me in the face. I take like two steps, go uh down by the car to mm-hmm. check on myself and he stops and actually runs back the other way. Oh. So when I stand up, he had actually come back and flanks me. He's behind you at this point. So he had, so if I'm looking at 12, he's like at eight o'clock, mm-hmm. seven, eight o'clock. So I have my, my, my gun up and I'm looking and the next shot takes the gun out of my hand and it takes my thumb off. Just the whole top of my thumb is gone. I uh, sprays. I uh, I know it sounds. I don't know why I'm laughing, but it it just was one of those things. Everything goes slow mo. Poof, gun goes. I have no idea where my gun goes. I'm staring at the bone at the end of my finger, and the only thing I can think of is, damn, that's gonna leave a mark. I had Oof. nothing else. That's all I'm thinking. I'm like, shit. Now he just keeps shooting. Because at this point, you don't recognize you've been shot in the chin and there's a I, there's, I, there's, I honestly thought it it like just nick graced me. it yeah and yeah. I'm like okay because I wasn't talking I didn't need to talk uh, so I was like okay that's not bad but that one in the hand was like okay yeah. that 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 sucks so then he's lighting me up some more he hits me in the upper arm hits me in my my femur uh, it goes through uh, the side of my thigh hits the femur bone uh, rides over it breaks apart rides up and most of it comes out my groin uh, so now my left leg is jelly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what I don't know is that Sam is almost there. So Sam's pulling up. He's almost there. He's 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 there, obviously, for for to evaluate the scene. But he doesn't know the taking on that you're taking at this point. No, he just knows I'm there because right. I call on the radio. Uh, he's he's not quite there yet. But he's, he's there. He's coming there. over he's, that hill you right, described. He's, he's, he's cresting the scene he's, at this point. He's actually, he's popping the median. Okay. Yeah, and you'll see it here. He's popping the median. So uh, I don't have anything. How my, long has it been, by the way, just before, since you got out of your car to the point where he gets there, just roughly, do you have an oh, idea I'd how say, long that would be? Uh, uh, it's less than a minute. See, that's the crazy part about this whole story is we we go through this in this detail, and it feels like it's this really long time, and at the end of the day, one minute. It's oh, not, it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's a it, matter it, of minutes yeah, it's, here. You know, so it's 
10, 29, yeah. 48 is when, and you'll see him come up. But my shooting's still going on. Wait, and, and we'll get to that part. So I, I, because I had moved up from my squad, he had circled back. It's me, then him, then my squad. So I can't get back to my squad. I have no idea where my gun is. My left leg's jelly, and he's still shooting me. So the only thing I have is there's a car there. Get behind the car, get under the car, and I stick my vest out. You know, I just give him nothing but my back, and he comes by, boom, 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 shoots a couple more times, hits me in the back, and then there's nothing, man. And this is the weird part about it. There's nothing. It's quiet. There's he, nobody shooting me. It's the only time in all this that I get like a second to catch my breath and back to the breathing mm -hmm. thing, close my mouth, breathe through my nose. And as soon as I close my eyes to get a breath in, I see my wife Ann's face. And when mm -hmm. I see my wife Ann's face, I think of my wife and I think of my kids and I'm like, I'm not dying on a fucking parking lot. This will not happen. I got to get back to my car. And I also know as he walked by shooting, he now gave me access back so I could get to my squad. And I think if I can get back to my squad, I'm just going to hop in and I'm going to run them over. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing I got. It's my weapon. I'm going to kill him. Yeah, because one thing that but you recall, I remember you talking about your, your AR got jammed. That's a locking mechanism locking thing. Mechanism yeah, the lock, the lock would not open for me. Yeah, when you try so, to pull it out, you're having a salt. Oh, it's Murphy's Law. Because right. you know, it's my off. I forgot to mention it too. It's my off day, so I shouldn't even been at work. I'm going on my honeymoon in eight days, so I figure I'm, my sergeant had uh, his kid was graduating ROTC, so we flip days. Then I go out. I check the the squad. Yeah, that the AR release won't work, and I'm like, yeah. What's a big thing? It's a, I'm just going to take it Sunday morning. So it's a, like the convergence of all Murphy law. Right. So anyway, uh, in my head, I mean, it, it's, it's actually good that you talked about the, the, the time mm -hmm. uh, manipulation. Uh, I, th I think I'm under the car for like 30 seconds. And, you know, I'm like, I got to get back to the car as soon as that's it. And I make that thought, I'm getting to the car. I'm getting in the car, I'm getting in the car. Whew. All right, here we go. And I roll out. All it was was him going by, boom, 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 ran out of ammo, drops his magazine, oh. takes another one out and loads it. That's it. So in my head, like you, I'm like, oh, this is taking forever. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm recollecting my thoughts, I'm getting my drive, and this is just, it's almost like instantaneous. But in my head, it isn't. So when I roll out, he's there with a fresh, uh, a fresh new mag, and now it starts. And he's freaking boom, 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 and back to the range and everything else. When I'm looking at him, it's like looking at you. Mm -hmm. There's no emotion. He's not excited. He's not yelling. He's not anything. And what is amazing to me, he's using one hand. And now he's just walking me back, just boom, boom, boom. And in my head, all I could think of is I'm getting to the car. So I'm pushing on my heels and my, in my hands, you know, slide my ass across the drive, you know, the, the, the parking lot. And he's just boom, boom, boom. He doesn't have any hearing protection either, does he? He has one. He's his not stupid. He kept one hearing thing of hearing protection in his ear. Wow. So one's open, and he's got one right. of the little right. phone so plugs. So he always has. And if you've had the, one of the phone plugs, and they you might come miss out. some, yeah. like, but mostly you're going to hear everything. Right. You know, uh, but he knew that just like he left the keys in the ignition of the car. So he didn't have to run out and fumble with keys. Leave them in there. Come in, you turn it on, and you go. So this was, again, we go back to the old planning. Right. Uh, and, and again, he's just... Walking me down, might as well have had a ham sandwich in the other hand, because there's nothing. Damn. And I'm like, all right, well, this ain't going good. I, I have to get back to the car. So I, I turn over and I start low crawling like it did in the Marines, and he's light me, light me up more. And then finally the shot comes. And I'd, it, he's six foot four, and they, it, I talked about this a, a lot. 
And only one guy was able to give me a, a reasonable explanation. And like, I never understood why he didn't come closer. He always stays like from a good six feet away. Why not just come up, put the gun against my head and end it? None. And the one guy brought it up because because in the military, you don't do contact shooting. Everything's from a minimum six, seven feet. It's almost like he's at, staying at a safe distance so that he you can't right. do anything to him. He's right. got he's got that, control over the situation. All his training has always had him right. do shooting from a distance. Right. And, and it's funny you say that because all in my head, I'm like, just get close enough because if I can hook your heel and pull you right. to me, I'm going to fucking bite your face off. <laughs> So I'm not, it's going to be good for me, bad for you. But he never closes that gap. Mm. So as I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm still moving backwards. And the shot <coughs> comes, and that's the one that hits the top of my vest and skims off and goes into the back of my skull. Mm. And that one just flattens me. It's it's so loud and it's so bright. It's uh, If you've ever had a concussion, put your concussion on steroids because it was just, like, I, I can't even explain it. Now, now Sam is here. So After, after all of that? Well, he's... Because it has happened not, like in a minute, not, right? Not quite, not quite, and I'll tell you why. Because, but we're going to watch Sam here, and you're going to hear Sam say his badge number is 45 minus 62. So you're going to hear him say 4, 5 to 6, 2. I hear sounds of shots. Can you confirm? Kind of hard to confirm on the radio when you're the one getting shot. Mm. So he's actually listening to me. So do you have a radio on you and you're hearing that? I got I I no no my my hearings yeah totally. so you, this is just for him yeah yeah this is this is an after that I can yeah tell you the script but at the time no and especially with that one in the back of the head that was I wasn't hearing anything for a bit. Okay, so what Sam does is, again, he, we were coming from pretty much the same distance away, but the actual turnaround uh, to head back northbound on is, is a quarter mile away. So you watch him jump the barrier, uh, the median to get in. Shots. You'll hear him. So uh, Sam takes six shots, uh, hits him once, uh, goes in his side, cuts him in half, and he's going to bleed out, uh, but he doesn't wait. So the, the one thing that's notable on that is there's Sam. He's got 25 years as a firearms instructor. How many times does a guy yell or does Sam yell, drop the gun? Three. Like, yeah, three least. times. How many times should you yell, drop the gun? None. Yeah. Oh, just shoot. If I'm if I'm aiming a gun at you, that there's all bets are off. Guns travel, but bullet goes a thousand feet per second. You can't outdo that. Mm-hmm. I don't know why he did that. Uh just like I my initial uh watching this, he drives up and then he drives back. And I had to ask him, like, dude, come on now, why? 
And he said, well, the last thing you said on the radio was just come in behind me, which I did. I, I didn't have anything. So when Sam gets there, he looks over the top. He says, and I see the guy, a guy waving. He says, it's near your squad. So I thought maybe he's pointing to something. But what he was doing was he'd hold on Sam and then he'd shoot me. And that's why when Sam goes back and he's like, I hear sounds of shots. That now at this point, he's just walking me up from behind. Pop, pop, pop. Mm -hmm. So now everybody else is going to show up. Uh, everybody, there's a a hill that you'll see off to the right at the top of the hill. There's a garage. Uh, guys are already up there uh, staging. And as you watch Sam do this, you'll hear them all yell one more shot. And that's the bad guy killing himself. Okay. So it's hard to tell, but the bad guy is right behind this median right here. Okay. At that point, is that Sam going up the hill? No, Sam's still buying a car. Uh, that was a couple of the guys, John, Dean, and uh, then Derek's up the hill. It really is the best spot to look from. Yeah, you can oversee everything. Yeah, high ground. Okay, so what had happened was uh, after I got that shot in the back of the head, it took me a couple of seconds to shake it off. Mm -hmm. So when they initially yell, where's Murphy? If you look straight down the alley, uh, the, you know, the entranceway, you can see it. And Samuels, I don't know where Murphy is. So at that point, I was still in between cars. Uh, and then I was able to shake it off. And then I was getting to the back. Uh, you can see him. Kind of deposited myself here. There's a little puddle, uh, but so right in between where this talking, you see all the placards there from evidence. Uh, there were 26 shell casings. So between me and then he took, I think two shots at Sam. So he shot me 24 times in that minute, or you know, minute and a half, whatever it is. So by then. Uh, like I said, I was able to shake it off, pull myself out, uh, prop myself up on an elbow. And uh, remember I said I was going to go on my honeymoon, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm laying there and I look down at my hands and my leg and I'm like, man, 
She's going to be so pissed at me because when I can be able to go on a honeymoon, that's all I could think about. Not I'm going to die, just my wife's going to kill me because when I can be able to go, you know. Where, were you, go where were you going for your honeymoon? Key West. Okay. Uh, it took a year, but we got there. Uh, but at any rate, so that's when you see Sam walk up on him and then he goes, officer down. I had crawled out, so now he could see me. Uh, so 24 shell casings. So it's 26 around me. Yeah, two probably bet two went to Sam. If you look, there was actually one goes through his windshield. Mm -hmm. I saw that when it came through on the video. Yeah, which is that's 76 yards with a handgun. I'll show you where that that lands. I uh, of the 24, and forgive me for asking, all 24 hit you? No, no, no. just 15. Oh, only 15. Could be, we could have been 24. It could have, you're hating your <laughs> perspective. Or it could, have, it could have been one in the wrong place, right? Ooh, yeah, exactly. Which, wow. well, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I, I'm a big believer in this. Mm -hmm. I, where your brain tells you you go, your body follows, not the other Amen. way. I, so in the United States, 82% of people get shot and lived. I, and if you get to uh, the guy who was the... ER doc in Vegas. Remember the hotel shooting there? Mm -hmm. At the Country Music Festival. Yep. I, I, I had a chance to watch that, that guy do a presentation. And he said, at least at their hospital, if you make it to the emergency room alive, you have a 99% chance of living, regardless of what shape you're in. Wow. So I, I bring that up just because... I mean, the point being made is I'm no different from anybody else. Mm -hmm. That there's nothing. It's just where's your head at and breathing and control. Is that survival rate because well, of this, Alex? I, Find the weapon. So what we're looking at right now is the back seat of your car, right? So they we, we practice officer rescue all the time. Uh, so this is actually pretty standard for us. And what they're doing is they're putting you in the back of that car. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be all right. Where you hurt? You shot? Give me a med bag. Give me a med bag. Cover. Where's the guy up Just one shooter. It's just one shooter. Yeah. Keep talking to me, Lord. Keep talking to me. Somebody give me a knife. Give me a knife. So he sees cut my vest off to give me some air. Let me breathe. And at this point, the medics are on the way. They're actually staged right outside the temple, so they're ready to roll. faster if they asked me where I didn't get shot and it's just hands and feet and we're done you know you know obviously you know for our audience we're, we're not going to show that video um, for many different reasons but one of the things that I saw in that video um, breathing you breathing a lot obviously not huffing and puffing but deep breaths and the second thing was um, you know the body's fight to flight your your awareness during that and not to go into shock to where you can't communicate what's going on, you know, and you, and you might have been on the edge of that. But that, to me, as I'm looking at that, I, I don't know that I don't know how that happens. So in my head, uh -huh. 
I, I only because I've witnessed this before. If you're the boss and you lose control, your guys are going to lose control. Everybody's going to lose control. It's going to turn into chaos quick. Right. They go as the leader goes. So in my head, if I my guys are watching me and I'm screaming, then there's going to be an issue, and, and I can't have that. So that's in my head was, I got to back to the control. I got to control me, and if everybody's looking and like, okay, he's he's okay, then they'll operate better. Mm -hmm. And and that I think that helped. Uh, I was able. When I got to the hospital, my blood pressure was normal and my respirations were normal. That's unbelievable. Uh, just because that's all I concentrated on was I got to breathe. Uh, so it's three in the left hand, wow. three in the left arm, one in the right hand, one in the right arm, each leg, two in the head, uh, one in the chest, one in the side, and then one in the back. 15 shots. So 15, 15 wow. altogether, yeah. Uh, and and to, you know, I, I make no bones about this part either. So this is uh, when it's your day, it's your day, and when it's not, it's you, it's not. It, this is there's at least five on me that should have killed me. Mm -hmm. uh, the one is still behind my carotid. It's two millimeters behind my carotid artery. I still have the one in my skull. I have enough. I tore my meniscus back in March. They can't do an MRI on me because I have too much metal in me because mm. I have too much shrapnel and just little pieces of bullet and, and, and whatnot. So there's, you know, it was whether you believe in it or you don't, that was God saying, not yet. Not your day. Not, not, not today. So, I, you know, I think you help yourself along for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think you could talk yourself into shock super quick. And then if you go into shock, things are going to go bad. Right. But I was still able to roll over in the ambulance and yell at the fireman because he's driving too, he's driving like an ass. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm not dead. You know, don't fucking kill me. <laughs> and he just looked at me. His eyes were like saucers. And we're all friends, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the other part of this. You know, Dean's a good friend of mine. I know his family. He knows mine. So now he's looking down at his boss and and I was his trainer. And his friend. Yeah, I, I mean, I know his kid, all that. And now it's hard. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it looks good in the movies, oh, I'll take care of it. But when you have a relationship with somebody, man, it's it's way harder than you think. And that that does cause problems on the back end of things mm -hmm. uh, if you don't take care of it. So I, I'm here and... Uh, I didn't. I don't put Bob's pictures up <laughs> just because it, you know, passed recently. But those are the six people who died, and they went to pray. Mm -hmm. And you should be in. I mean, if that's not one of the safest places, you know, for you to be in, I don't know what is. And just because somebody had a twisted yeah. ideology and wanted to leave a mark, but if I didn't tell you his name, you wouldn't remember his name, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, that's so. They all want to leave it, and really, this is the way he ended up. You know what I mean? You could see where Sam shot him. Mm -hmm. uh, round came in here. It didn't come all the way out. Uh, but we, he would have bled out, and then he shoots himself in the head. So I'm I'm very harsh on this, but I'm like, why don't you just do that in the first place? Yeah. If that was going to be your end game, I mean, right. we talked about it before at the 10th anniversary, which was, you know, just that month and a half ago. I'm listening to kids who lost parents and grandparents and will never be walked down the aisle by their father because somebody doesn't like the way they looked. It's, I mean, it's, that's, to me, it's unacceptable. It just is. And, and then, you know, on the, the, the flip side of this, you know, I, I was super fortunate because I have people around me. You know, that's my wife and they're in the blue. And if that was a friend, I wouldn't be here. I know that. And my kid brother was... Uh, second grade detective with MIPD. They flew him out. Uh, and I was able to, you know, walk myself out 17 days. 17 days later. After the shooting, I had a trachea tube in. I had a feeding tube in my stomach. They, my my throat doctor had told uh, my wife and I, you'll never eat again except out of the tube. Trachea tube was going to be in for the rest of my life. And I'll never be able to talk again. So I remember that was the third day. Uh, we just got out of ICU and went to a regular room, and he, he told us that. And I remember looking at Ann and just shrugged my shoulders because I'm like, okay, that's what we got. 
we got to deal with that. But then when you're laying there in the middle of the night and you're by yourself and you're thinking about, man, my life was good. Mm-hmm. And now my life ain't so good in the blink of an eye. That's the hard part. How do you pick it up? Mm-hmm. How do you how do you put all those pieces or totally redirect? I mean, I've been guarding people since I was 18 years old and now I'm 49 at this point. And so it's like, now what do you do? I was getting my master's degree. I was working on my thesis at this moment. So now that's gone. So what what do you do with yourself? And that's, I, I guess that's when you face adversity of that grand in nature, you do have to, you have to sit back a second and go, all right, what's important? You know, what are, what are my priorities? And I remember, again, I'm, I'm a huge Stoic fan. And if you like Gladiator, then you know, you know Marcus exactly Aurelius. Yeah. So the impediment to, impediment to action advances actions and what stands in the way becomes a way. And that's the way I looked at it. What stands in the way is my physical ailments and I don't know what I'm going to do. So now I'm going to turn that and I'm going to make it, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get beyond this uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my dexterity back. I'm going to work like I always have. And then I'm going to take this, this negative and I'm going to turn it into a positive. And this is going to be the message. You have to do things. You can't sit. You can't stagnate. You can't say, poor me. You have to move on. Because, you know, and we all know this, uh, but when it's your turn in the ringer, man, it's different. You yeah. know, uh, it, it, it's just what it's all about. And I know when I talked to uh, Samantha, she had, you know, told me like the, the crux of this was health, wealth, and happiness. Mm-hmm. And I, you can ask her, and I said, my first answer to her was, do you know who I am? <laughs> And she's like, I said, did you? Yeah, I asked. I'm like, do do you know my story? And she said, no. I said, well, you should probably look at that first. (laughs) Uh, But really, when you you look at it, you know, and if you don't know what memento mori is, it's just very simply, it's Latin for we all die. We all die. Nothing you're doing now is, is you're, you're not changing the end game. We're all going to die. It's how we live that separates us. What, what is it that you can do every day that's going to make your life a little bit better than the day before? And not only your own life, somebody else's, you know, and that's back to that. It's, I, I swear to God, I didn't do this because you had, I had the slide up there. You know, it, it's that one more. It's that little bit every day. It's that, that ability to take, I'm going to read a half a second more. I'm going to breathe the minute I feel myself get upset, I'm going to breathe. And and that's what's going to take me back. I'm going to read something I wouldn't normally read so I can grow as a person. Mm-hmm. I, I can get a little wiser about things. And more importantly, I'm going to become a little more empathetic. Because I think the more the minute you stop studying, the minute you stop doing anything, it, it dies, it atrophies. It's like and, a tree. Exactly, and and what's the point then? So you you went, you bought that, you you planted it from a seed, you grew it, and then all of a sudden a branch broke off, and then what do you do? Go well, that's the end of the tree. No, you got you you got to nurture it, you got to bring it back, redirect it. Branches are still going to grow if you give them room to grow, but if you don't water yourself, you don't feed it, you know it, it, it's all going to be bad. And you know, mimesis, I don't know if it, 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 it this comes from Epictetus. So Epictetus was actually with Nero, and what he saw was, and in, in all of what was going on, was everybody wanted money, everybody wanted power, everybody wanted fame, in in that particular time, and he said not for anything else other than that's what somebody else had. Mm-hmm. So you get lost in this this whirlwind of, but. Quentin has this, and Alex has this, and they got that, and you lose total sight of what makes you happy. You're only worrying about what makes them happy, and if it makes them happy, then it'll make me happy. And there's a total falsehood in that. What makes you happy is totally individual to you. And 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 that, to me, if you have that healthy aspect, that, that happiness aspect, your health and wealth are going to go by because you're going to come to realize and when I die, the money ain't going to be there anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I'm not saying I did. And my dad, and we grew up with nothing, man. But my dad always said money's just a tool. 
Mm-hmm. That's it. Accurate. So, uh, you know, when you look at all of this, and I, I noticed it when I was working, I noticed it when I, I was fortunate, I've been to able uh, to travel the world. And, and I saw people who really had nothing, like nothing, nothing, living on a two by four in monsoon season in Thailand or in, uh, I was in Afghanistan when the Mujahideen were there. And you're right, man, that's nothing. So these, you do come more reflective and say, this is what I want. This is what I want for myself. And the minute I can get myself to a better spot, then I can make sure my wife, my kids, and everybody. And that part for me took the longest time was I was one of those guys that always, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? And I, I neglected myself. And you can't do that either. Mm. You can give, but you got to give to yourself. You got to make time for yourself. And and really that's the whole thing because, you know, if if you have stuff, but you don't have friends to share it with, it's poor. Well, I have it. Exactly. But it doesn't do you any good, you know? And if you don't, you don't have your family. That's a great photo. Man, you, you don't have anything. And, and you know, I, I bring this up because, especially in Copland, you know, we have a, such a high rate of divorce because we all are the, the alpha and I'm going to be in charge and I'm not going to share my feelings. And that's just all crap, man. If you're having a bad day, everybody in your house knows you're having a bad day. Right. Own it. Just go, I'm having a bad day. I'll talk about it tomorrow. Just give me a little bit of time. I'm going to breathe it out, meditate it out, and then I'm going to come back and go, I was at a car accident today. A two-year-old got killed. It was a sucky day. I'm sorry if I'm not perfectly myself. But you got to give it up. Right. You know, you can't own it and take it to the grave with you. That was the point. Again, it's my my wife, Ann, was the was the one because she's she's wicked smart. And she was like, let me guess. You know, you're going to get another Oscar performance for your nothing happened at work today role. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I guess it's not going as well. And she goes, no, <laughs> just say what's on your mind. Right. So again, it goes back to, no, you know, be, have your family, have your friends and everything else follows suit. It just, it just all goes along with it, you know? And I know we're going to be talking about it, but really uh, to be a better leader, man, you got to pick up that broom. Uh, and, and I always bring up that one of the best books on leadership ever is Legacy, the story of the All Blacks, the winning his sports team in the world in, uh, you know, in the 19th century or the 20th century, the New Zealand rugby players. And that's what they talk about. If you're the leader of the team, then you got to you got to sweep along with everybody else. Mm-hmm. You got to pick up shit just along with everybody else. You don't get to just sit there, you know, and own it. If you're if you're the boss of a company and the, the new hire does it wrong, you own it as well as they do. You hire the person who hired the person who hired the person that didn't train them. It's still a piece of yours, right? It, it always is. And what I tried to be in the back of the squad, just be the calm in the storm, but be Mister Kalika, be that person who can protect people, take care of people, know what's going on, and give it their all. And and people will flock to you naturally because they know you're not going to yell at them. You're not going to scream at them. If I need advice, that's where to go. And that calm will take you back to home when the three-year-old is causing a fuss. You, you, you still do the same. You know what I mean? Uh, and echo everything you do echoes with somebody else. Never realize that. To even the 10th anniversary, so I'm, it's the first anniversary, and this goes back to the 15, the magic 15. Uh, a little woman comes up to me, and she says, oh, Lieutenant, you're my hero. And I go, no, 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 I, Mr. Kalika was hero. That ain't me. And she goes, no, 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 I was in the pantry. And I was like, oh, man, I didn't know, because we didn't get any reports from the FBI. And I said, I'm, I'm happy you're okay. She goes, do you know how many people were in the, in the pantry? And at that point, I'm like, no, ma'am. And she goes, there was 15 women and children. I'm like, that's incredible. I'm just happy. And she goes, you don't get it, do you? And I go, no. And she goes, how many times did you get shot? And I said, 15. And she goes, there was exactly 15 of us in there at that moment. And that's when you come to realize, man, as an echo, everything you do echoes, reverberates. And and that's where you got to look and go, man, I, I got to do good today because it's going to mean something to somebody else down the road.
the, I think there's not a person in this room right now that's hair is not standing up on their arms and the back of their necks. When, honest to God, when she first said that to me, I, I got it, but I had to, <laughs> I feel like such a wimp man. She said that and I was like, it, it just like, like a lightning bolt that hit me. And I had to pull the, oh, hey, who's that? And I made her look away and I freaking ran because <sighs> I just didn't know how to deal with that. Yeah, how you take that in. That. And you're like, man, it's, it's bigger. It's, it, it's always, life's always bigger than you think it is. Wow. You know? do, you, do you feel like this event was a catalyst of your beliefs and, and uh, training and everything, or did it totally change your course? Was this an amplifier of things that existed within you, or, yeah. or was this something new that was almost like a revelation? No, and I'm glad you asked that because I, I got asked that a bazillion times after like, oh, this was, you know, a divine intervention, and you're, you must be so much different now, and... Maybe my wife would go, no, he's not. He's exactly the same. There's like that's, nothing has changed. And and fantastic. I thought about that and I thought, why would I change? That's what got me to that point, you know, good and bad, being an absolute obstinate. And my wife will attest <laughs> to that. I'm that obstinate. That helped. Right. It did. But all that training, everything culminated in that. Uh and and it wasn't and and I think it's okay sometimes to take ownership of. I did all that hard work and it paid off, you know. Yeah. So to the person that maybe, you know, like might look at this and say, "Well, I don't have your training. How can I try to live this way?" Or you know, what do you think about that? Or what would you recommend for them? I, I learned it from my mom. Okay. I. Resiliency, okay. So resiliency comes from adversity. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the ways to do that is, all right, now you open it up, now you get it, all right. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I, I have two older sisters and I got a uh, younger brother, but my younger brother's six years younger than me. So when we grew up almost like in two different phases, right? Mm -hmm. So every night we got beaten. Every night we got spanking. At, that's just the way our house was. You ate dinner at five, took a bath at six, and got a spanking at seven. That was that. And but then I got it. My sisters and I would bet who could go the longest without crying. And it got longer and longer. Till finally the old man was like, Screw this, you guys are wearing my ass out. I'm not doing this every night. Or I remember we all used to sleep, we had nothing, like I said, all sleeping in the same bed. And he'd come in with a slipper and we'd all stick our knees up and he'd just like, <laughs> and then we'd just be laughing because it, it's all temporary, man, uh, to me. Mm -hmm. And and that's how you have to look at it. I mean, I used to, I know it sounds weird, but like even washing the dishes, I would make the water hot enough that it hurt. Not that I was burning my hands, but that it hurt. So I knew, okay, this is a little bit more than I feel comfortable but then I could still get by. And and for, you know, fortunately, unfortunately for me, growing up, I was always one of the smallest guys in my neighborhood. And I'm a wise ass. I make no I just am. And I wasn't that fast. So it was like the trifecta getting beat up every day. And and you learn that all of that, like everything is temporary. Mm -hmm. and, and so grow with it. Mm -hmm. Like if that's the worst, it's good. And and again, it, it falls back to everything. Every day is a gladiatorial event. Something in your day did not go great, and yet here you are. Mm -hmm. You just had a, a, a Ian run through here, and guess what? You're still here. Right. It's gonna suck. No, and nobody takes that away. You know. Trust me, when I gotta get shots in my throat, it sucks. But it's still. Better than my mom. Mom was getting chemo, and knowing she was dying, mm -hmm. I, I, I'll live with my couple of minutes of feeling uncomfortable because it could be worse. Mm -hmm. And again, it always comes back to that. But did you die? Because right. other than that, if and I, and you know, I, I look at my my daughter, my oldest, and my sister died in March two thousand twelve. Her, and she was like a surrogate to mom, to my daughter. 
Then her real mother died in June of 2012. And then I get shot in August of 2012. Mm. You're 21 years old, living in South Korea, teaching English. Pretty shit year, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. And we went through this. And she's like, yeah, but. And I'm like, no, no, no. You will probably never have a year that bad in your life. And yet here you are. So what else you got? Because if it's not those three things happening again, it's not as bad. Yeah. Got to put things in perspective. Yeah. Exactly. And, that, you know, what it's like, 90 percent, you know, it's like Tony Blower with the fear thing. So much of our, our pain and our panic is man-made. It's, it's 90 percent in our head. Mm -hmm. So that's the hardest part is to clear the imagination from the reality and go, that hurt for really only this amount. And then the rest was me feeling bad about that amount, which was nine times that. So a uh, long-winded answer to how do you do that? A little bit every day, one more, just well, one more thing. Yeah, and it sounds like focusing on on little ways to get out of your comfort zone is super important because that, that seems to be a theme in your life is yeah. you constantly just push the envelope a little bit to, to get out of your comfort zone, but not not to the point where you're trying to run an ultra marathon on the first day. It's it's the little things and it builds I up. I deadlifted right. more after I got shot than I did before, just because it was like, you know what? Okay, next. Yeah. yeah. What we got next? It. All right, let's do this. Yeah. Well, your thermostat was changed, that's right. for sure. It, exactly. And then, yeah. okay, and then once you do that, then you're like, okay, I know I can do that. What else should I try? You know, let me let me try a little bit of this. Let me try a little bit of that. But we have an antique store. Before that, I know nothing about finishing furniture, wiring, any of that. Do it all now because it's trial and error. And I think that's where we're in a bad spot is we're afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. mm. And we should never be afraid to fail. Right. Ever. Unless somebody's life is at stake. But other than that. Man, I have wrecked more furniture <laughs> because I'm like, oh, that'll work. And then I'm like, oh, crap. Somebody get a blanket because if your mom sees it, she's going to kill me. But you, you have to. You know, that that's where you you learn. You know, and then back to the Stoics, they, you know, they have a whole thing on, you know, I feel bad for people who haven't faced adversity or have not, never challenged themselves because you don't know what you're capable of. I mean, it, it, Michael Jordan will tell you that. He missed way more shots than he made. Right, but he still took them. You got, you know, you got to be okay with going. That shit didn't work. I'll you, try something else. You know, I wanted to point out something that I thought was interesting when I picked you up from the airport today. Do you remember the gentleman you were talking to? I see guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought that was uh, interesting because, you know, what we discussed earlier, a lot of that was driven off of hate, fear, whatever. And I think that, uh, you know. Interestingly enough, what are the odds when I pick you up today at the airport? When I pick you up to the airport, that literally you're out there talking to a seat guy. I think I blew him away because I I talked to him in Punjabi. I welcomed him. I saw the dialogue as and I pulled up, and I saw like, him like kind of turn his head like in awe, and yeah, I was wondering what you guys were talking about. Happen, so I yeah. just I, because. I obviously have a, a close connection with the Sikh faith. Mm -hmm. And since 9-11, they're one of the most persecuted religions in the United States because of the way they look. So whenever I have the opportunity, just say, hey, somebody knows who you are mm -hmm. and what you believe in, and it's all good. Just... I could tell. Yeah. I could tell the uh, the sense of relief and appreciation he had as you walked away to get into my vehicle. And, um, you know, I think that uh, there's a lot to take away and kind of unpack from what we just heard mm -hmm. a lot. I think, you know, for me, second time hearing this, there's a whole nother wave of stuff to unpack. I will say that this was equally, if not um, more um, disturbing and also uh, enlightening the second time around. Maybe because I thought I knew what I thought I knew going into this one, but hearing it a second time watching the videos, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a lot to take in, but I will say this. Um, we're very thankful that you would come out here today and share this story with us and uh, answer our questions and kind of work through uh, the PowerPoint with us today. 
you know, I know that wasn't your friend, but you did a great job, but I wanted to say thank you very much. Um, you know, you, you did an amazing job. Uh, we greatly appreciate you coming out here. And, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, it was an honor when I met you in February, having breakfast with you that morning. Uh, you know, I talk about divine intervention, you know, getting a chance to meet people. And, and uh, I remember the person that invited us to lunch came up to me and said, Hey, you're really going to want to go to lunch with this person. Trust me. <laughs> Fast forward. Here we are in October sitting down doing a podcast. And I just want to say thank you. Very hey, ben, much. Honest to God, thank you for bringing me down again. Yeah. I, to me, it's, I don't, this is not my normal circle. Mm -hmm. uh, so I learn stuff all the time and I, I appreciate you doing what you do because sometimes I think it's so quick to overlook. Everybody's got a story. Everybody's so it's something to learn from somebody. I don't, I don't care who it is. So, uh, and it's starting to cool off in Wisconsin. I don't mind coming down where it's 80 degrees, <laughs> That's to be honest. But hey, again, thank you so much yeah. for having me. And uh, if you ever need anything, give me a holler. And Will too. Alex, thanks for being on the show today. Uh, as always, it's great having our co-host by our side here. And uh, for those that uh, want to hear more about this story, you want to hear more about uh, Brian and, and, and his take on uh, life as well as survival skills, as I heard there, um, visit him at uh, bmurphy at armorexpress.com or BAM training. I think it's BAM training 101 at gmail.com. And then his Instagram is bam.murphy.training, Facebook, BAM training. Guys, get an opportunity to get a chance to reach out. I know he'd love to come talk to your audience and see what he can provide to you guys as he did us. And guys, if you like what you heard, please subscribe, smash up the like button, leave some comments, visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you again for being on the show. Thanks for being on What's Your One More. You guys be safe. Thank Me you. Too. Thank you. I got one more shot, I'm gonna make it. One more chance, I'm gonna take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it I got one life to live, so I put them all into it, yeah